Hello, welcome everyone to the first session of the live stream of the Guest Education Global Leadership Summit. We'd like to thank everyone for listening and hope you're looking forward to the amazing sessions to come. A few bits of information about the live sessions before we get underway. There's a chat panel located on the right hand side of the GRIP platform. Please feel free to ask us any questions and our lovely moderator will get back to you. We'll do our best to pass this along to the speakers and panellists. Um, please note that they are moderated, so there might be a slight delay in your questions showing or an answer. We'll do our best to get through them all. If we don't manage to, then don't worry. They're saved in our system and we'll get back to you after the event. Uh, without further ado, I'm thrilled to announce our first keynote, Gavin McCormick, Principal, Teacher Trainer, Children's Author and Philanthropist from the Far Farmhouse Montessori School in Australia. Thank you, and over to you, Gavin. Hello, Assalamu alaikum wa wa barakatuh, everybody. Um, first of all, I am extremely honoured to be here and talking at this wonderful conference. And uh, obviously, hello to everyone around the world who's tuning in here in Australia. It's uh, night time, and wherever you are, I hope you've had a wonderful day. Today, we're actually going to be talking a little bit about uh, education, obviously. And from my perspective, being a mainstream teacher for 15 years and then navigating towards Montessori, um, I found that I have a true and well-rounded understanding of the whole circle of education. And I'd like to start by um, telling the audience a story. As everybody knows out there, um, most of the empowerment that comes from teachers is through wonderful storytelling. So I'd like to begin by sharing a story with you, if I may. And this involves me sharing a slide with you. So I hope you can all see this. So before you, you'll see uh, a young boy holding a picture. And to anybody, um, what you think you may be looking at is just a boy who's drawn a picture. But actually, what we're talking about, what we're looking about, is something called the, what I call the learning circle or the cycle of learning. And essentially, what that is, and I think what we need to address as an educational uh, institution and as an educational movement in the world is that learning um, has a deeper uh, meaning than just understanding what's going on in textbooks or learning what the outcomes are in the curriculum. I think that in order for us to really take learning on and, and take our children to where they need to be, we need to make learning real. We need to make it tangible and we actually need to allow our children to understand why we are bothering to teach what we teach. Now, there are many ways in which we can do this. And the first um, story or the first example I want to share with the audience today is about this little boy here. This little boy is called Anand and he lives in a place called Butwal, which is in the south of Nepal on the Indian border. Now, myself as a primary school teacher, as a Montessori teacher and as a school principal, um, I've obviously had a lot of time over 20 years working in education. And one of the reasons why I became an educator was because I wanted to make a difference. Obviously, we all know you are not in teaching for the money. This isn't about the money. This is about making a difference and making sure that you use your time wisely to change the world. Now, Little Anand here um, lives in a small village, and in this village and where he lives, there was no school available for him and his peers. Now, I've established a charity several years ago called Education for All, and for the last seven or eight years, we've built several schools across the Himalayan region. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is not to tell you how wonderful I am. The reason I'm telling you this is because I believe that as teachers, as leaders, as executives, we're all role models. And we need to show and model the behavior that we wish to view in our community, in our teachers, and also in our students. Ultimately, our students are very astute. They look up to us and they will be as we are. They will follow in our footsteps and we will be their guides and their role models. Now, two years ago, I was building a school in Butwal. And this little boy here, Anand, it was his village where the school was to be built. Now, I hadn't been to the village yet, However, I'd seen pictures and I realized there was really nothing there. So being the principal of the school, I put some suitcases out in the hallway uh, outside my office and I told the students in my school that I needed their help. Now, I didn't want to make it too tricky, but I told them that if they had anything spare at home and I gave them a list, jumpers, trousers, pens, pencils, papers, paints, anything that you think 
a child will enjoy or need, you can please pop them in my suitcases. I'll make sure I deliver them to the Himalayas. Now, the next very, very next morning, I pop downstairs um, in my office, and there outside my office is a little boy called Sam. And he's holding eight colored pencils in his hand. I said, good morning, Sam. He said, Gavin, these are for the children of Nepal. And there were eight pencils that were from his bedroom, wrapped in an elastic band. I said, thank you so much. I'll make sure they get to who needs them. And I pop them in my suitcase. Now, two and a half months later, I, um, I ended up going to Nepal and building a school in Anand's village. And uh, as you can see, you know, there he is. And two days before we opened the school, I popped lots of tables outside and I put some paper out and some coloring pencils. And little did I know that the children in this village had never seen a coloring pencil before. They'd never drawn a picture and they never had a chance to express themselves in the way that you see right before you. Now look how proud he is. Just look at that picture. He's so proud. His first drawing is his house. He's colored it in. He's extremely proud. Now, three and a half months later, I returned to school and all my children in school were waiting for me to arrive. And I made sure the first thing I did was I went to Sam and I said, Sam, remember those pencils you gave me? And he said, yes. And I said, let me show you a picture. And I took him to my office and I showed him this picture. And I said, this is a little boy. He's 13,000 kilometers away. And by giving me those pencils on that day, you have changed his life. This was his first ever picture. And that's because of you. And he turned and he looked at me and he said, I'm going to collect more things for you, Gavin. And since then, we built several schools. And each and every time, he has made sure he donates something that he owns. Now, he's only seven years old. But the reason I'm telling you this story is because learning is much bigger than facts. Learning is much bigger than passing an exam, achieving a grade A, or being top of the class. Real learning is about empowering our students so that they can understand that no matter how old they are, how small they feel, or how powerless they feel when they look at the bigger problems in the world, the very smallest gesture on their behalf can make the biggest difference. And the reason that we're establishing this in our educational reform or the reason we're putting this into our curriculum is because we want our children to understand that what they actually do in school has meaning. And what they learn in school and what they get from the curriculum empowers them to make a difference and make a change. Now, this little boy who's only seven realized that by donating something to me, it was going to make a difference elsewhere. And later on in his life, what he'll understand from that is that everything has an intention. He has a great power and he can make a difference. And we'll come to a little bit more of that later on. But I just wanted to share that story with you because I thought it's a wonderful story and extremely empowering. Now, I guess the reason that I uh, wanted to come on to this talk today was because I really wanted to speak in great depth about the, uh, the role of skills in our curriculum, as well as the academic side of curriculum. And I'm sharing something on the screen with you right now. And actually, all the listeners here today, we've got school leaders, principals, heads of department, I really want you to um, look into the resources at the end of this and the handout section and download this PDF, which I've actually uploaded. It's a booklet. Now, this booklet, which I put together with one of my staff members, Thomas Krieger, over a long period of time, was put together with a great deal of research. So what we did was we had a look at the curriculum. We understood that there are learning outcomes, objectives, and curriculum identifiers. But there's more to the curriculum than that because, yes, facts, academics, passing an exam and achieving high scores and grades are extremely important. Yes, we need to know these. These are part of our academic cycle. These are part of what we need to survive in the world. But there's a whole branch of education which I feel has a silence and I feel is missing in many of our schools around the world. And that side of the education is the essential skills side of things. Now, when we look at some of the biggest companies in the world, Amazon, Wikipedia, um, Google, you know, when we look at these companies in the world, when they look for to hire executives or they look for developers or testers or people to come up with innovative ideas, 
They don't look just for people who've got a high score or a high grade or they went to the best university. You see, that's only part of their success. The other side of their success is having the skills to make things happen. And these skills we call soft skills or essential skills. And when we look at this list, which is before you here, you see that these are extremely important in our schools. They're very important in every business and every company in the world. Things like time management, collaboration, teamwork, empathy, resiliation, you know, all of these things, without them, we would have limited success in the industries we work in, of course. You can't go in to work for one of the biggest companies in the world without time management skills. You can't get through something that's very difficult if you haven't got the resilience. You can't help somebody else or understand what one of your teammates is going through if you're lacking empathy. So in this resource that I've shared with you here today, what you will see is 40 weeks, four, broken into four sections. And in each week, we cover a different essential skill. And the idea is that this should run like a river under your curriculum. So regardless of the content that you're teaching in school, whether you're teaching narrative writing, you're teaching fractions, you're teaching dinosaurs, or you're looking at some of the other concepts of the curriculum, this sits underneath or on top of your curriculum. And you know, as a school, that in week one, you're going to be focusing on empathy or happiness or contentedness or time management or resilience. And that's always a subject that you can talk about. It doesn't have to be explicitly taught, but it can be identified in our schools. But the question is, and this is a question I get a lot, is how on earth are we supposed to teach essential skills? How can we establish a routine in our schools which allows these skills to flourish? You see, I was in India two years ago working in a school. And as I left the school, I met a boy outside. He was revising from a document. And I said, excuse me, you know, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm revising for my examination. And I said, wonderful. You know, um, what are you doing? Reading a paper, researching a subject? He said, no, I know the question. This is the answer. I'm just memorizing it. So in the exam, I can achieve 100%. Now, his dedication was astonishing and phenomenal. But the skills that he was getting from that were actually very limited. Now, he might get a very high score in that examination. However, it doesn't tell us much about how he would operate in a you know, high stress organization or when he had to you know, show determination or manage a difficult uh, you know, project. It doesn't tell us that. But essential skills mixed or matched with academics actually develop a wonderful, rounded, well-rounded student. And we call this educating the whole child. But the question that I was referring to earlier is, how can we make sure that these are actually established in our schools without directly teaching them? And the answer to that question is, as schools, as leadership teams, and as curriculum designers, we must change the way we teach. We must stop the system where the teacher stands at the front, the students sit in the classroom, everyone's quiet, and they listen to the teacher. You see, when we have this in our environment, ultimately what we're saying to our students is, today I'm the teacher, you're listening to me, and today you can only be as smart as me. I have the information, you're the students, I will give you the information. If you can remember everything that I say, then you will get a gray day on Friday. Now, in order to develop essential skills, you see, that, that example I've just mentioned there gives limited scope for children to actually develop the skills that we're actually looking for because everyone's quiet, everyone's putting their hand up, everyone's listening, they're not talking when they're being spoken to and you know they're being kind of dictated to as to what the content is. However, if we actually shorten our lessons and rather than teaching our children all the time, teaching them direct information, if we say, today we're going to learn about volcanoes. Now, I'm not going to tell you everything. I'm just going to inspire you. Now, Mount Vesuvius erupted in 738 AD in Pompeii. The eruption was one of the largest eruptions in the world and actually engulfed the whole city. Now, you inspire your students and then you pose this wonderful question. You say to your students, now, what would you like to learn about volcanoes? And every hand in your classroom goes up. Every hand goes up. And you say, tell me. And the children say, yes, I'd like to know how hot is lava. Great question. Another child says, 
What's the size of the largest volcano ever erupted? That's a wonderful question. Are there any volcanoes on Mars? That's an amazing question. And they come up with their own research questions. They establish their own curriculum. Now, first of all, we're giving the child, children a choice. We're giving them a voice and we're giving them a say in the direction that we want them to go. Now, obviously, you write the curriculum, you know the content, but suddenly this is an exchange and you're giving them a chance. You're giving them the confidence to be able to choose the direction they want to go. And essentially, it's one of a great essential skill there, isn't it? Giving the children autonomy. It's wonderful. Now, when they pose their questions, what we then say to our children is, these questions are wonderful. Now, I'm going to give you one week to go away. You can research these on your own. You can work with a partner. You can work in a group. I don't mind who you work with, and I don't mind how you show me your research, but I'll see you back here in one week's time, and we are all going to learn from you about volcanoes. Now, at that very moment, what happens is this, and I know because I do this on a daily basis. Your, chart, your classroom is engulfed with noise. And when I'm talking about noise, I'm not talking about noise that we don't want to hear. I'm talking about noise that we do want to hear. Suddenly, children are deciding who are they going to work with, where are they going to work, who's going to get the paint, who's going to get the clay, who's going to sit where, and who's going to work with who. And as the teacher, you step back and you observe. And what do you see? You see leadership. You see collaboration. You see time management. You see organization. You see exactly what you need to see. You see not only who is smart, because you know that. You're doing your assessments. You're teaching your children. You see who the leaders are. You see who's got the potential to teach in future. You've got, you can see lots of things at that point. And it's extremely important that we have that time. You see, many teachers that I work with say, it's too hard. I don't want to give that freedom to my class. It will be too noisy. But if you walk into Google head office in Chicago or in San Francisco, what do you see? Is it silent? It certainly isn't silent. There's people standing up having a debate. There's people sitting on the ground. There's people working as a team. There's people working on their own. There's people on the telephone. And this is what we should be seeing in our classrooms. What we want to see is a dynamic learning environment where children are allowed to work where they want, with whom they want, but more importantly, we want them to be able to represent their research in a way that suits them. And the reason I say that last statement and the reason I think this is so important is because what makes children love school is when they feel they're coming to school to follow their passion. You see, we all have a passion. You know, my passion is running. OK, so I go to work all day and it's wonderful. But then I, I can't wait to get home to go for that run because that's my thing. That's what I do. OK, it might be fishing, it could be painting for our children in our classrooms. The way if we want to make them run to school and then go home regretting leaving and wanting to come tomorrow, we need to make them believe that they're coming to school to follow their passion. Now, when we have them sitting in rows, all in silence, listening to, to the teacher, because I know everything and you're going to learn from me, what we do is we strip that from them. But when we say that statement to our children, and I don't mind how you represent your research, what we then say to them is, I want you to find your niche. You see, your architect, your future architect, will always come back with a model. Your dancer will come back with a dance. Your playwright will come back with a script. Your journalist will come back with a report. And your paleontologist will come back with a diagram or a sculpture. And this is what we need to do. We need to allow our children to show us what their drivers are or what we call the hook. What is their hook? And when we inspire them, allow them to write their own curriculum research questions and then say, off you go, I don't mind who you work with, where you work or how you represent your research, we give them the freedom of choice. And ultimately, we do ourselves a huge favor as teachers because while they're all working and while they're all independent, we have a chance to step back and then watch it in action and understand more about how our children learn and what it is that makes them tick. Now, 
we have a lot of leaders here in this conference. I'm a leader myself as a school principal. And, you know, there is no secret model or genius to, 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 to leading. Obviously, we all have a lot of passion. We all have a lot of drive. Um, but leadership is a really tricky one because actually it's not about telling people what to do. It's about taking care of those people who are working within your institution so that then they can actually inspire others below you. And as us all working in schools, this is very tricky. But I, I guess the crux of my talk today was around about modeling and around as leaders in this conference, we need to be modeling the behavior we wish to see in the entire community. And this goes back to my initial story of the circle of learning with little Anand and his drawing at the beginning. You see, I wanted to show my community or the children in my school that they had power. I wanted to empower them. So I modeled that behavior. I took a risk. I went to Nepal. I built a school. Then I came back and I told them, hey, you can do the same. But I think the most important point that we can take heed of as, as leaders is trust. Quite often, as leaders or you know heads of department or curriculum writers, um, what we do is we we overmanage situations and we end up micromanaging the people under us, and that's one of the worst mistakes that we can make. You see, they're the people at the forefront. They're the people in the classroom. They're the people teaching, and teachers are very underrated. I'm also a teacher. We underestimated our skill level. We are a profession. This is a professional. Um, occupation. You don't go to the doctor and question his diagnosis. We don't sit in a surgery having brain surgery and ask the surgeon, are you sure that's the right part of the brain? And we shouldn't be questioning our teachers on how they teach. Yes, we provide them with curriculum. Yes, we provide them with guidelines. But we need to allow them to teach in a way that they believe is right. We need them to find their niche. Each of your teachers will be unique from a different country, have a different culture, have a different belief system. We need to let them shine. And if we try to model them too much or mold them into something that we want them to be, we take away that shine. And ultimately, we take away that inspiration. But when we trust them, then they start to believe in themselves. When we let them design their own classrooms, when we did let them design their own curriculum content, we let them shine. And ultimately, when our teachers shine, our students shine. And when we show trust in our educators, our educators show trust in their students. And what does trust lead to? Trust leads to cultural change and independence. And one of the greatest skills that we can see in our teachers and our leaders and our future leaders of tomorrow, which are the students in our schools today, is independence. Ultimately, our schools should be a place where children develop the confidence to try something new, but the resilience to try again, even though it fails. Academics are important, but essential skills are equally important. And I want to finish there and say thank you very much for inviting me to this seminar. Thank you very much for inviting me to this webinar. And I'm happy now to answer any questions that anybody may have in the audience. And uh, shukran. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gavin. Um, if any of the audience wants to download the document Gavin was talking about, we posted it in the session chat, and it's also in the handouts on the screen here if anyone wants to download that. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Um, I haven't seen any come in. So. Um, thank you so much, Gavin. That that was really amazing. I know the audience really enjoyed it from the comments we've had in. People have said how, how inspiring they found that. Um, once we finish the session, the audience will be directed to a short survey. So please do tell us what you think and let us know if there's any topics you'd like to hear about in the future. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, we're also on social media. So follow us at Guess Education on Twitter and use the hashtag Hashtag Guest Global. Um, a massive thank you, Gavin. Um, and don't forget, our next session is coming up in about 15 minutes. Thank you very Can much. You Can I say one thing before yeah, I leave? Yeah. So, uh, look, I wanted to share with the audience, as soon as there's, there's no questions here, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to say that, you know, for the last two or three years, you know, part of my, um, part of my motive um, in terms of my work ethic has been around giving everything away. 
So, you know, over 25 years of working in education uh, across the world and, and doing seminars and webinars everywhere, I developed hundreds, thousands of handouts and, and, and everything you can possibly imagine. And I put everything onto a blog. It's completely free. Everything's free to download. And I maybe could give that blog out to your mm -hmm. audience, or you can actually just Google my name, Gavin McCormack. It'll probably be the first thing that comes up. And if you click through onto that blog, you'll actually find hundreds and thousands of handouts, articles, PDFs, everything you can possibly imagine. And um, you can contact me there also, and I will share anything else that you might want. That's great. Yes, if you can share that with us, we'll we'll definitely put that in the chat so people can can follow up and, and find that. That'd be brilliant. And that's such such a great thing to to share the knowledge, um, which I think is so key, especially in the the current situation at the moment. And um, we do have one question actually that comes in come in if you don't mind. Someone's asked, how can we make um, students work independently on an online session? Well, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? Because we, we had that situation here. Um, you know, we um, in Australia, we, we didn't have a large lockdown. Our lockdown was only you know, six weeks long. We've, we've in Australia, we've done very well with COVID, uh, a lot better than my home country of England, which is done terribly, unfortunately. Um, yeah. But yes, we, we only had about uh, four to six weeks of lockdown. And as a Montessori school, we had that exact problem because. Um, Montessori is all about tactile learning. It's about touching and feeling and hands-on. And suddenly we were asked to go online and that proved extremely difficult. But going back to one of the statements I made earlier on around about designing curriculums, what we did as a school was make sure that when lessons were sent out to families, there was a lot of structure there that allowed children to then go off and devise or design something that they found interesting rather than, you know, having uh, something which is quite, um, you know, stagnant and you will do this and do this and do this and submit it here. It was, hey, did you know this? Now, why don't you go and find out this? Tell me what you found out later on. So it was all very hands on and investigatory, but actually really interesting. Um, something that was really successful was um, in our school community, we sent out um, a what we called a practical life handout. And um, I don't know if you know what practical life is, but practical life basically is lots of activities that you can do in the house. They may not seem educational, but they're extremely well uh, regarded and worth taking heed of. So it's things like caring for a plant, baking a cake, planting some seeds, doing some gardening, cleaning the bedroom, sorting your socks, these kind of things, which don't seem like much. But actually, when we learn these life skills, it's really important for our students. So, for example, you know, in the school I'm running right now, children at the age of three are packing their own bag to come to school every day. You know, and they might come to school and you find out they've forgot their lunch or they've got no hat or they've got no coat and it's raining outside. But we allow them to make that mistake. We don't fix it for them. And then we say to them, what are you going to do tomorrow? And they say, oh, tomorrow I'm definitely going to remember my hat because I wasn't allowed to play out at lunchtime. And those practical life activities develop a great deal of independence in our students. And you, know, you can do that from a very early age. Rather than dressing your child and saying, these are the clothes you're going to wear, you put three piles of clothes on the bed and you say, which pile of clothes would you like to wear today? And they have a choice. They feel independent. However, you made the choice for them. It's kind of like the silent puppeteer, if you know what I mean. So it's tricky when you're doing online learning, but hopefully that doesn't last very long now. We're all getting vaccinated and getting in back to school. So that's wonderful. Cross fingers. And we've had one more question that says, um, is there a specific essential skill to integrate for a specific age group of students? Well, look, I guess there are many uh, skills. Some of them aren't appropriate for the youngest uh, of our students. However, the big overarching uh, essential skill, which I always focus on and have as the most important one of all is independence. It literally is the key to successful classrooms, successful schools. When you have children who are independent, 
what happens is you see this amazing um, development within your school. And I'll give you a really good tangible example of that. I was teaching a few weeks ago and um, you can imagine my classroom. So I've given this lesson. I said, OK, guys, off you go. And children are working in teams and groups and on the floor, standing up. Someone's having a debate over here. And it's all action. But there's a lot of work going on. A lot of learning's taking place. Um, and I approached four girls who were sitting in a little huddle and they were doing a project on a dinosaur. And I said, hey, girls. And they were kindergarten, so they're only six. They're five and a half. And I said, girls, it's time for your science lesson. Would you like to come over? And one girl turned and she said, Gavin, we're really busy today. Do you mind if we do it tomorrow? And, you know, I walked off and I was really uh, happy and proud with that because I'm a school principal. But essentially, a five and a half year old said, hey, Gavin, not now. We're in the middle of something. Can you come back tomorrow? And, you know, that kind of skill, you can't teach it. You actually have to change the structure of your school teaching learning environment just to allow that to happen. And I think that's the big problem, that as teachers, and I've been this teacher before myself, so I know exactly how this feels. We feel successful when we have complete control over our class. Everyone is silent. Everyone's looking Eyes on me, eyes on me. This we've all had that we've all heard that statement before, right? But to me, when you've got a silent class with all eyes on you, are failing your children because they learn so much more from each other. And I'm not talking about content, I'm talking about skills. They'll tell each other stories, they'll have debates. I don't want to work with you anymore because you're being too bossy. I'm gonna work over here. You know, these kind of things. And when I was at school, if I spoke to the person next to me in the middle of class, and I'm sure it was the same with you, Sarah, the teacher would say, You two are talking, separate. Right? And now that was an ultimate failure. What the teacher should be saying is, you two are talking, stay together. Because when you do that, they've got to figure out, hmm, if we sit together and talk. We're not going to get anywhere here. How are we going to work this out? And they'll say, we can either stop talking or we can move. And they, if you let them make that decision, you then allow them to be independent and make that choice. And ultimately, you know, at the end of the term, they might fail their little test that you give them. You say, well, do you know why you failed? Well, yes, I was talking too much. Yes, what are you going to do next term? I'm actually going to not sit with Robert because I talk a lot with Robert. I'm going to sit with Stephanie instead. Okay, and it's that. That's the absolute key, because we know that if we don't make mistakes, we don't learn from them. You know, I've done thousands of these webinars and there are times when I've logged in with one minute before it goes live and there's a mistake. The Internet's not working. The camera's broken. And oh, no, it's an exact disaster. And I will never do that again. I was here today half an hour early. <laughs> I learned from that mistake. And we need to do that with our children. This is really important. Really important to allow them to make those mistakes. So ultimately, I know it's a long-winded answer to this question, but independence is the key here and everything else comes second. Brilliant. Thank you so much. What a lovely note to, to end it on. And um, you can probably see from the Q&A, we've had loads of people just say thank you so much. It was really profound. So, so thank you again for your time and uh, we hope to have you back at Guess another time. Thank you, Gavin. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, have a wonderful rest of the conference and day and hopefully see you all soon.